Hello, everyone. Welcome to our international workshop on COVID vaccines. And I'm very pleased to get started today. What I'm going to do is hopefully set up our conference by talking about the state of the art of COVID-19 vaccines. So really kind of summarizing the technology that we're working with and then talk a little bit about what's coming up next. So 12 billion COVID-19 vaccines have been given in just 18 months. Since December 2020, most of those vaccines have been administered in high income and upper middle income countries, certainly for the first year that they were available. And over the last year, lower middle income countries have had an uptick for sure in the amount of vaccines they've administered. And it's really only recently, unfortunately, that low income countries have started to vaccinate. This translates to wide total global vaccine coverage. Amazingly, you know, more than 60, 70% of people in the world have received um, at least one dose of a COVID vaccine, but it's very different depending on where you live. So in high income, high middle income countries, um, sometimes up to 90% of people living in those countries have received a single dose, whereas in other areas, it can be less than 10%. Since COVID vaccines have rolled out, the primary challenge um, in terms of how effective they are has been the presence of new variants. So SARS-CoV-2 evolution. Our vaccines were developed and then studied during the early phase of the pandemic in which we had um, very few variants, actually it was very similar to the original strain. However, in 2021, when these vaccines were fully rolled out globally, that's when we saw the emergence of Alpha and then Delta, and then the most challenging of our variants, the Omicron variants. Despite the presence of all of these new variants, I do want to drive home one persistent point, which is that these vaccines have really done very well against severe disease and death despite the new variants. So this is a modeling figure that was done looking at the United States, uh, predicting that <clears throat> or estimating that these vaccines have prevented, uh, I think, over 2 million deaths in the United States. And this is true um, over several surges, but importantly, including the Omicron surge. All of these vaccines that have been rolled out around the world are actually quite different. We, we have lots of different ones that we've been using and which vaccine you've received really depends on where you live more than anything else. So for example, this is a figure I put together of just a whole bunch of statistics available <clears throat> looking at the different vaccines that are used. So in the United States, we are most people here in the US have received an mRNA based vaccine. So Pfizer or Moderna, and that's true also in the European Union. And then there's other countries like South Africa, which are a mix. So initially in um, South Africa, they had only access to J&J, &J, and then uh, lately they've had access to mRNA. Um, and then I wanna bring your attention to two countries that are very interesting in this regard, China and India. So China um, has almost exclusively given inactivated virus vaccines, but in total that actually adds up, including these other countries that got it to more than half of the vaccines given around the world being inactivated viruses. India is interesting, huge number of doses administered in India um, and a great majority of them being AstraZeneca. How did we get here? How did we get all these different vaccines? Well, they really represent the evolution of vaccines for viruses. So starting in 1796 with our friend <coughs> uh, Jenner and the smallpox vaccine, uh, really live attenuated viruses have been the workhorses of our vaccines and remain so today. So most of our pediatric vaccines like measles um, and mumps, rubella, those are live attenuated viruses. It took about a century before we invented anything new. So in the 1900s, really mid 1900s is when we started trying a safer alternative to live um, attenuated viruses, which is purified inactivated or killed viruses. And we still use that a lot today for influenza. That's a lot of our influenza shots are, are based on that tech. But in the 1980s to today, we saw an acceleration of more sophisticated engineered vaccines that express either viral subunits, meaning like a protein or a peptide, um, or start to introduce actual genetic material like viral DNA, and then of course, recently viral RNA. And our World Health Organized 
uh, organization authorized vaccines really represent this whole range of, of vaccines, except for live attenuated viruses, which never really have been tried for SARS-CoV-2 for, you know, because it, it would be too dangerous. So <clears throat> I'm going to start by talking about Pfizer and Moderna, our mRNA-based vaccines, um, which are the ones that are maybe the most recent in technology, but the most widely used, um, <clears throat> or some of the most widely used. So how are these vaccines made? Manufacturing begins with plasmids, which are small rings of DNA that contain gene, the gene for the spike protein. And E. coli bacteria take up these plasmids, um, and this bacteria are grown in large fermenters. Then that bacteria is lysed and the plasmids are released and purified. They're cut, those DNA segments are um, cut out of them and linearized. And then those DNA segments are then transcribed into strands of mRNA. The mRNA is then mixed with a lipid solution and that actually has a couple of purposes. The first most important is that it coats each of the strands to help with stability, um, but also acts as an adjuvant. And then these, the solution of lipid nanoparticles are put into files. The advantage of mRNA is that the fast manufacturing is really ideal for pandemics. Um, and there's actually a few opportunities for contamination in production. Um, there's no cell lines that are used to express these proteins. It's just the bacteria and the plasmids. And mRNA, once it's administered, does not enter the nucleus or integrate into DNA. And it's degraded pretty quickly by normal cellular processes. Another advantage is that it doesn't require, it doesn't use a vector to be delivered meaning that you don't have to worry about developing any antibodies to the vector. The disadvantages are that the lipid nanoparticle itself can cause some symptoms, and we've seen that with these vaccines. They can be um, cause quite a lot of uh, arm pain, for example. <clears throat> it's a new technology. We really don't have any long-term safety, more than two years of safety uh, record for these vaccines for mRNA, and so we're really learning about that safety profile in real time. Um, the technology is not widely adopted, and I should say not widely available in low and middle income countries, and that for sure is a disadvantage. Um, it can be difficult to ship and store, and we now know about some rare side effects, including um, the fact that it can elicit myocarditis or pericarditis, particularly in young men. The two most prominent mRNA vaccines, the ones that are really out there everywhere, are BNT162B2, which is the Pfizer vaccine, and mRNA-1273, which is the Moderna vaccine. Both of these vaccines were shown in their original trials against the circulating strains at that time uh, to have greater than 90% efficacy, really against all symptomatic infection. And then this was borne out in real-world effectiveness data shortly thereafter, showing you know, tremendous efficacy against <clears throat> those early strains, pre-alpha strains of, of SARS-CoV-2. Well, how has mRNA performed over time? And this is just a snapshot from the New York Times showing <clears throat> rates of cases and deaths in the United States. And recall, almost everyone in the US, except for a small number, have received mRNA. And the <clears throat> daily case rate um, is two times as high in those that have not been vaccinated compared to those fully vaccinated. And for deaths, they are eight times as high if you have not been vaccinated. And this covers the whole Omicron period. So again, I just wanna show, yes, there's a loss and an attenuation of protection against cases, um, but these vaccines are still um, effective compared to no vaccines and very effective at, at preventing deaths. The World Health Organization, as you know, has many vaccines. And so I'm gonna turn now to our ad uh, vectored vaccines. Again, um, some of the more recent technology, but also some of the more widely used. So how are these made? You start with a, picking out your serotype of, an, of adenovirus. So you can pick, you know, say adenovirus 5 or ad26 or the chimp adenovirus vector. Um, and you design your sequence <clears throat> by deleting out some key genes. You delete these genes that are essential for adenovirus replication. And that way you make your virus, this vector replication incompetent. You then add in your gene of interest, in this case, your spike protein gene. Plasmids, again, our plasmids are used to make this recombinant adenovirus DNA. And then this is a step that's different with mRNA, which is that the recombinant Viruses are grown in special cells, usually mammalian cells. And in these cells, we add back the missing proteins that are required for replication. So that's the trick of how we actually are able to produce a lot of these replication incompetent viruses. 
Then the cells are lysed and these recombinant adenoviruses are filtered out and all that cellular stuff is purified out. Um, and then these vectors are added to vials for distribution. The advantage of ad vectors um, or really vir any viral vector is that they efficiently leverage host cells to manufacture the spike protein. So it looks like a virus because it is a virus. It enters the cell in the same kind of way. And so intracellular protein production and the presentation is very natural. And this seems to elicit a more comprehensive immune response. So, you know, actually innate immune response, humoral and cellular. Um, additionally, adenoviruses are often selected because they can accommodate a large DNA payload or insert. Um, also, they don't integrate into DNA, um, so they don't integrate into the host genome, which is important. And they often can act as their own adjuvant because they look like a virus, and so your body reacts immediately once it sees it. The disadvantage to these are that pre-existing immunity to adenoviruses can diminish vaccine potency because you can, if you neutralize the vector and keep it from infecting a cell, well, then it's not gonna work. Um, and this is seen predominantly with really common adenoviruses like adenovirus 5. Um, additionally, growing viruses in these large bioreactors in mammalian cells, you know, is very vulnerable to um, manufacturing issues like contamination, for example. Um, and does take more time than mRNA production. And as these vaccines have been rolled out, um, we now know that there are rare side, rare side effects associated with them, including um, this thrombotic thrombocytopenic syndrome, which the mechanism of which is that these vaccines elicit antiplatelet factor four antibodies. Um, and then this leads to clots and thrombocytopenia. The Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine is one of these ad vector vaccines, CHADOX1, um, and the efficacy of these vaccines, you know, is a little bit less than what was reported for mRNA when they came out, um, about 76% in the United States, um, with attenuation for sure um, in some of their studies against some of the early variants of concern that came out. And because of some of that mixed data, it was never actually authorized in the United States, but it is authorized by the World Health Organization and has been used widely um, around the world. It's been associated with this TTS risk, um, but again, remember those, those side effects are rare. The other AD26, AD5 combination is the Sputnik vaccine, which is in Russia. And we don't have a ton of data, but it's reported to be 92% um, efficacious in the early studies. Johnson & Johnson is the ad 26 vector vaccine, and this was developed as a single dose vaccine, uh, the one and done vaccine. And its early studies in the early period showed 74% efficacy in the United States. So that was less than the two doses of mRNA. Um, but it did hold up its efficacy in some of these early studies with new variants, um, like the beta variant that was in South Africa. And this was one of the first signals that maybe these vaccines would hold up protection against severe disease, even though it lost its protection against cases. And again, there's the risk of TTS. So how did these vaccines really do against Omicron? Well, in the laboratory, it was pretty devastating what it looked like. It looked like almost complete loss of neutralization, which is true against Omicron. So on the left are neutralization titers elicited by the Pfizer vaccine against different variants. Um, on the right is the AD26 J&J vaccine, both of them showing a loss of neutralization, um, AD26 more pronounced against Omicron. But what's interesting is that these vaccines really have held up their effectiveness. As I said, I'm gonna be like very repetitive here uh, against severe disease. So this is um, a graph of cases, hospitalizations and deaths in Guateng, which is part of South Africa. And what this graph is really demonstrating is Whereas in each of these surges in the beginning, you saw that the new cases, hospitalizations, and deaths always track together. Um, as you move into the Omicron wave, you saw a divergence um, or a discordance where the cases uh, started to go up uh, more than hospitalizations went up and way more than deaths even went up. And most of the time that South Africa experienced these waves, they were only really vaccinated with J&J. &J. So I think we're getting a bit of a signal of vaccine effectiveness for J&J &J against variants. Um, and then certainly the combination often heterologous boosting with mRNA was um, showing the benefit that you can see with both wave four and wave five in South Africa. 
So then moving on to our inactivated whole viruses. Um, these are made by first starting with SARS-CoV-2, so the original virus, you grow that up in the cultures. And then you inactivate those live viruses with chemicals. Um, and this prevents the viruses from replicating and it keeps the spike protein intact. Now you do get a lot of debris in this process and some uh, remnants of the virus, but in general, you're really trying to keep that virus intact, it's just dead. Um, then these viruses are purified and they're often mixed with an adjuvant like aluminum, something like that to stimulate the immune system. Because by the time it's injected this dead virus, it doesn't quite look like the original and it doesn't enter into cells. So your body doesn't see it that same way. Um, and most prominently, we first saw these types of vaccines um, in the 1950s when Jonas Salk used them to create a safer polio vaccine. The advantage, as I said, is that they are safer, particularly compared to live attenuated vaccines. And this is because they cannot revert to the wild type virus, they're dead. Um, and this is better for immunocompromised and pregnant population who can't get live attenuated vaccines. They're very easy to store and ship. Um, you don't have to worry about the virus dying, it's already dead. Um, and that's ideal for low and middle income countries and the technology is widely available and, and easy to adopt. The main disadvantages of these vaccines is that they're less immunogenic. Um, they may require up to five shots to equal a live virus <clears throat> immunity and the immunity is less durable. Part of it is just like I said, it doesn't enter cells, it doesn't act like a virus, it doesn't always look exactly like the virus, so it's a little less immunogenic. Inactivated vaccines, we don't talk about them that much in the US, but we really should be talking about them because they comprise roughly half of all the vaccines that have been delivered globally. Um, but they're a much smaller fraction of our literature in terms of our data on efficacy and effectiveness. The estimated efficacy against early SARS-CoV-2 strains was about you know, somewhere between 50 and 70%. Um, so, and some of that data took a long time to really come out. Um, we assume that the effectiveness against Omicron is attenuated, um, just like all of our vaccines have been, but there again is a suggestion that there's preserved protection against severe disease and death, even with our less potent um, inactivated vaccines. So a little signal of this, you can extract from data coming out of Hong Kong, where um, a lot of people in, in Hong Kong have received Sinovac or Coronavac, which is an inactivated virus vaccine. Just for context on the left is the graph of new reported cases in Hong Kong since 2020. And for most of the time, they've been relatively spared um, from COVID-19 until the Omicron surge in the last couple of months. And then there was this enormous spike in new cases. On the right is looking at the incidence of new cases in people who've received no vaccination, like in red, versus one, two, or even three doses of vaccines. And in this figure, it doesn't break them out between inactivated versus mRNA. Um, but here you can see together that there is a loss of protection against all cases um, with preservation of protection against severe disease. The additional data in this paper, which I'm not showing here, shows that pretty much that's the same breakdown if you, if, when you look at Coronavac versus mRNA. Maybe a little bit more loss of protection with Coronavac against cases, but otherwise the two vaccine modalities actually look pretty similar, which I think is, is really interesting. I'd love to see more hard data on this to see for sure how inactivated vaccines are performing. So now I want to talk about Novavax, which is one of our only examples of a viral subunit or protein-based vaccine. Um, for these vaccines, one or more key viral proteins are identified as the key antigen for immunity, so in this case, spike. And then the protein is purified from inactivated whole virus. So for Novavax, as an example, the spike gene here is inserted into a baculovirus, which then infects moth cells, which then produce the spike proteins. So that's how they do it compared to other systems. There, they harvest the spike proteins from those moth cells, and then they assemble them into nanoparticles or clumps of those proteins. Um, and then this is mixed with an adjuvant, and then that's injected. So this very similar method is used to make licensed vaccines for influenza and HPV. Um, and so uh, this is actually an older technology than mRNA or viral vectors. 
The advantage of it is it is an established platform for other vaccines that have been used safely. These proteins are subunits with adjuvants. There's no risk of replication at all because it's just a protein um, and no risk of reverting to wild type virus. There tend to be fewer symptoms following immunization than other vaccine platforms. Uh, you know, it's less reactogenic than the uh, mRNA based vaccines. It's safe for immunocompromised patients, uh, safe in pregnancy, and has really favorable shipping and storage conditions because the, the proteins are stable. Problems with these vaccines is it's sometimes difficult to identify the most important antigen and you really commit yourself right up front because it's a slower process um, to make these. So if you pick the wrong protein, you're, you're really out of luck. Um, luckily for our uh, COVID vaccines, everyone used the same protein spike, and so that was the right way to go. Um, they require adjuvants to boost immunity. So again, they don't enter the cell. They don't really look like a whole virus. It's just a protein. So you need to like you need to um, stimulate the immune system to really notice them. Um, and sometimes the manufacturing, in some ways, even though it's kind of simpler to understand, it can actually be diff more difficult to implement. Um, and can be easily delayed, like if proteins become sticky or they're hard to purify, and that can really slow down the works. And we've seen that with Novavax um, and other, other platforms, other protein vaccines. Novavax showed 96% efficacy in the United Kingdom um, with some attenuation against variants. And then this was held up in um, the randomized controlled trial in the United States with 90% efficacy. Um, and then Novavax was authorized by the World Health Organization based on this data and is supposed to be reviewed by the FDA, I think, in a few weeks. I want to make a note here about the Corbivax vaccine. This is a subunit, protein subunit based vaccine, and um, it's authorized for use not by the World Health Organization, but it's authorized for use in India, um, as well as in Botswana and down to about five years of age. And it is being rolled out um, actually in like millions of kids. But I just want to make a note that there's no published efficacy data about this vaccine. The reports from the company making the vaccine is that it elicits antibody levels that we can assume are protective based on comparing it to other studies. Um, but there's really no, not a lot of published literature about Corbivax. And again, this is something I think we really need um, in order to feel confident about this vaccine as it is rolled out to millions of people, many of them kids. Novavax, um, despite its potential um, for use and the fact that it's often cheaper because it's been made available that way, um, has not rolled out too extensively around the world. Um, this is just a graphic showing some of the countries, the only countries that are really using it. So the summary of these platforms, you know, each platform has its strengths and weaknesses, um, and there's a portfolio of different vaccine types, and that's important because you really want to have options. Like maybe you have a rare side effect in one population and not another, and so you can kind of pick who you want to give which vaccine to. The reality, though, is that which vaccine is used is often just determined by where you live, um, more than you know, picking between this whole portfolio. Um, all of these platforms, really looking at the data in the big picture, have continued to protect against severe disease and death, despite new variants. And I think we've seen that, you know, in lots of different effectiveness studies over time in a lot of different areas, um, even with the inactivated virus vaccines. Nevertheless, these current COVID vaccines, you know, they really do have important deficits. And the main ones that I see, besides the fact that um, they're not equitably distributed, but in terms of their technology, they have shown a uh, real lack of durability in their immune responses. So seeming to require boosting in order to maintain this effectiveness. Um, and they've really lost protection against mild cases or asymptomatic cases, meaning they've lost protection against transmission of the virus. Boosting does seem to rescue this durability issue um, so vaccine effectiveness against symptomatic illness in Qatar during Omicron was significantly improved with the third dose. This is a figure just showing um, that uh, booster effectiveness was about 40 to 50 percent um, compared to just receiving two vaccines. 
And in the laboratory, we can see why this is occurring, why this effectiveness is restored, and that appears to be because of an increase in Omicron neutralization um, with boosting, which is fascinating because it's the same original strain that we're boosting with. Nevertheless, it clearly improves boosting against Omicron, um, which is shown here in this figure of three doses being much better than two doses, and uh, even so for with the heterologous regimens. This is data I've pulled from a number of different sources, looking at uh, protection against emergency room visits, protection against hospitalization, showing a marked improvement of protection against severe disease with boosting. We think a lot of the protection to start with against uh, severe diseases can be both antibody and T cell mediated, um, and both of those are likely uh, boosted with that third dose. And there's some sense that maybe heterologous boosting may elicit improved immune responses against the variants. Uh, heterologous means you start with one vaccine and you, you finish with another. So this is some data looking at the inactivated vaccine CoronaVac with two doses. And on the left in purple is their neutralization after two doses against Omicron, which was nothing. There was no neutralization detected there. Um, and comparing that to CoronaVac now boosted with Pfizer um, and then two doses of, of mRNA. So paying attention to that middle, uh, those middle dots, you can see that boosting with Pfizer, this different vaccine really, really markedly improved neutralization against Omicron. Now is three doses enough? So we've seen some data that that seems to wane that uh, rescuing of immune function. And so in Israel, they've rolled out a fourth dose in individuals who are 60 years old and older. Um, and again, showing at least short term, this is only 30 days after receiving that fourth dose, that there is effectiveness of that fourth dose of you know, up to 70 76%. So for, even giving a fourth dose does seem to really pull up your effectiveness again, again against uh, Omicron. Now, how long even this fourth dose immunity lasts is up for debate. This data, as you can see, is only a month after receiving that fourth dose. But as I mentioned, it's not really just about the durability and the protection against severe disease, but also a major weakness has been this loss of, of protection against infections. And there was a, I think there was a, a false sense of comfort with this back when Omicron started, where we thought, well, okay, as long as our vaccines hold up against severe disease, we'll be all right. Um, and what we learned from that experience is that, no, we, we weren't really all right, because what happened was there was um, uncontrolled transmission of this virus and a lot of rare outcomes like severe um, disease following vaccination added up to a lot, a lot, a lot of absolute numbers of sick people. And of course, there are many people who were not vaccinated during this period of time. So here's a figure from Massachusetts where I'm talking from, um, where we have very, very um, excellent coverage with vaccines. And even here, we could see during Omicron a uh, significant rise in excess mortality. So how can we block transmission? How can we make new vaccines that do that? And one idea is uh, intranasal vaccination. So really putting the vaccine um, stimulus directly into the compartment where you get infected. And on the left is um, an individual getting an intranasal vaccine right to the nose and the idea is that elicits IgA concentrated in that compartment that then can shut down viral shedding. Benefit of intranasal vaccines, you know, they may elicit this improved mucosal immune response. That's the whole thing, and it could block transmission. Um, in the past, particularly for the flu, we've used live attenuated viruses, and you know that can be a little unnerving, especially in immunocompromised hosts. Um, you know, also it's right there next to the brain, so we have to be very careful looking at that. Um, so, you know, we may end up using inactivated or subunit intranasal vaccines, in which case it might have to be as part of a heterologous regimen um, as a boost. We may also get some impact against transmission by improving our regimen combinations. So, for example, this is a figure just showing vaccine effectiveness against uh, illness, all illness, including mild infections with a combination of J&J &J and mRNA. And this is showing that just the dose of one J&J &J and mRNA actually brings up your effectiveness um, as high as three doses of mRNA. 
And then finally, the additional last approach to be sort of variant proof with our vaccines is to develop pan coronavirus vaccines. So this is using bivalent or multivalent vaccines, um, you know, where they express both, say, an original strain and an Omicron strain. Um, the use of computational modeling to identify novel antigens using multiple epitopes, using mosaic antigens that represent many clades, um, expressing more native-like looking spike proteins, or using two antigens like spike protein and nuclear capsid um, protein, or a vaccine that can express a highly conserved T cell epitope. So this is sort of the long list of really novel approaches to um, develop a pan-coronavirus vaccine. And really the most um, advanced of these approaches are some the, the bivalent vaccines, which both Moderna, Pfizer, and many companies have been working on. This is a little bit of data just showing that they, there is some improvement in the cross-variant responses using the bivalent vaccine. This is with Moderna. So <clears throat> on the left is the improved neutralization against the original strain, and on the right is improved neutralization against Omicron. So on the left of this right figure is mRNA-1273, the original, and then that's compared to the bivalent. And the bivalent has much increased neutralization of Omicron. So to summarize everything I've told you today, 12 billion doses of COVID vaccines have been administered in just 18 months. These vaccines continue to protect against severe disease and death, despite the emergence of new variants, sometimes requiring boosting, but they do protect. Current vaccine platforms have a number of important weaknesses that really need to be addressed. The lack of durable protection without boosting and the loss of protection against mild illness and transmission. Novel next generation approaches are really focused on these deficits. So that includes heterologous boosting, the mix and match, intranasal vaccines, and pan coronavirus vaccines. So thank you very much. And I look forward to the rest of the discussion and the other talks for the workshop.